how are you? <laughs> Good, how are you? <laughs> um, I, I, I heard you say a lot like, I'm a futurist. I think it would be nice to kind of like explain this because it's, it sounds so cool and it sounds also very abstract. I think it would be kind of cool to explain what, is a, what a futurist does. Yeah, I think um, the name sounds fancier than it is, but essentially track a lot of data, like qualitative and quantitative data, a lot pertaining to emerging technologies, um, but also like the geopolitics, um, societal trends, historical trends, and then use that data to make forecasts about the different ways the future could be headed. And it's not like predictions. I think if somebody tells you they can predict the future, that's an entirely different skill set. Um, and something more akin to magic, but uh, as a futurist, essentially just build forecasts based on data of where we could be headed. Nice. And um, I, so the way we know each other is through obviously like modeling, which is a completely mm -hmm. different, um, I guess, facet that you have. So how do you, you connect all of it or how, how, how did you start? Like, what was kind of the trajectory to, to kind of be so multifaceted? Yeah, I think um, my initial launch into my career had nothing to do with fashion at all. Um, I didn't consider myself a particularly fashionable person and spent most of my nights in the library, but I really didn't enjoy the kind of corporate life I was headed down. And then I was scouted by a modeling agency and I decided to kind of take a leap of faith and figured that there's pro there is a way my background in business and technology could connect in this new world as a creative. Uh, I wasn't sure how, but I thought it could just give me a chance to create a different version of life. And then once I stepped into the world of fashion, I realized a lot of people are very interested in technology and in the future in, in the world, in the creative industries in, in general. They just really weren't invited to those nerdier conversations I was a part of in my old world. And so that's when it, the light bulb really went off that maybe I could kind of bridge my creative world with my more corporate tech and business world. Uh, and it seemed to be a fit because I think, you know, there's a reason why shows like Black Mirror and The Matrix are so, so popular. You know, everybody wants to learn about the future, just not everybody's invited to conversations about it. And I think that needs to change. Like if we really want to walk towards a future that works for most people, a lot more people have to be in those rooms than just the four or five people who seem to be coding our future at the moment. Yeah, but also I think it's hard to kind of explain, like break it down for people to understand that, you know, like for example, like, you know, like we hear all of, you know, conversation about AI and all of those kind of big, like, uh, you know, headlines, you know, was it the guy from Google or whatever who just left and, you know, like, oh, be mindful of AI. And I think like, what I like about the future you are forecasting is mm -hmm. the way I see it is like AI is anyway part of our everyday life, but also it's something that is very useful and we should kind of see it as a useful tool and, you know, with guidelines, not be too scared of it, right? Yeah, I think um, a lot of our views about technology and, and technologies like AI have been shaped by Hollywood. Uh, and then they're anchored in our but evolutionary tendencies to anthropomorphize and add human elements to things around us, such as artificial intelligence. So that's where a lot of the fear stems from. And it also stems from not fully understanding the technology. And I think that's what overwhelms people. Um, but if you realize that you use some of the most advanced AI systems in the world every day, whether that's Google Maps or you watch Netflix, you are really entrenched with these systems. Uh, they're not as overwhelming as you may think they are. Um, and I also think because there isn't yet a, a, a open dialogue between the people building AI and society more broadly, we only get to hear mostly when things go wrong uh, or what scare people. We don't do enough of elevating the stories that are game changing uh, in a future that we would definitely want to be a part of. Um, and so I think that there's a lot, a lot of reasons why we need to have a much more open dialogue between technologists and society. Um, one, if we want to get our future right. Uh, and two, it can help us focus on some of the real fears and risks, because there are, of course, risks with a technology as powerful as AI, but not get swept up in kind of the Hollywood version of the fears, um, because then that distracts us from, from building a technology that we would actually want to use. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I mean, for example, like detecting cancer, you know, all of those things, you know, are thing where you know, like you would, you would, you would need and want AI to kind of be part of it. Yeah. Not, I, yeah. Oh no, keep going. No, no, no. I, I didn't want to cut you, but go, go ahead. I was just going to say, you know, AI thinks in a very different way than humans, and that's a really good thing. Uh, the way we approach a data set and AI is going to approach it entirely differently. So in many ways, we're going to have like these superpowers in every type of industry we apply it. So imagine like the way we stream the internet will soon be streaming artificial intelligence, which is a really cool thing to think about. Like you have a problem that you're trying to solve and you don't even know how to go about it. Imagine having a system that you could even just ask, how should I think about this? What data should I be looking for? What market should I start sampling this in? Or how do I make this a little bit more sustainably? Um, and having a system that can give you answers that are helpful. I think that's gonna be a really exciting, a really exciting time. Yeah, so that's the thing you were saying. Maybe now Google will be like AI assisted, meaning like you ask a question and it starts to be a dialogue and it helps you kind of process almost your your information, your thought process, which I think is, you know, amazing. Yeah, yeah. The internet is going to become a conversation. Um, so right now we have to like search things. And in the future, we just converse with these systems um, and get direct answers, which is going to be quite a game changer and also open up technology to a lot more people because I think. We forget that there's a lot of digital skills required in powering up a device, typing things in, understanding the interface, but systems that are going to allow us to interact with them just in our natural language, that's going to be a game changer for so many different demographics of society who maybe struggle with digital, physical digital skills, but can converse to an AI system the way they converse to their partner or a family member. Of course, access to devices and technology, that's a whole different conversation. But in terms of actual skills um, and accessibility of these systems, it's actually going to kind of lower the bar on the types of digital skills we need to bring to the table. But and this is like... Uh, maybe kind of going in the darker side, but like, so what about also like when we have all the generation coming in who kind of like struggle and everything, how, how to kind of also, or, you know, like who are not as used or not, not as agile. And this is from a personal perspective because I've seen, I've seen it happen fairly recently. How to make sure, you know, also kind of scams or all of that are not like AI wouldn't kind of like impersonate the things or, mm -hmm. or all of this, like how to kind of navigate traceability and also, you know, because I think there is a lot of abuse also in that end, like, so how 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 can we also kind of have guidelines with that as well? Yeah, and that, it is a really big area of concern and the smarter the systems, the more, the easier it is to scam people or use them kind of benevolently. Um, that's going to have to come from, on the one hand, regulation, right? We can't just, and, yeah. yeah, expect the, the industry to police itself. Uh, and even though most of the companies building AI are, are trying to do so for the benefit of humanity, there's always what's called the dual use dilemma where technology can be used in two different ways. Uh, and so in terms of not scamming people and tricking people, we need to have real meaningful consequences um, and deterrence from that for against that type of behavior. Um, because it's true right now, you can use AI and craft a much more elaborate scam at a fraction of the cost um, and that's much more effective to different demographics especially ones that are more susceptible to things like scams uh, like more you know older adults and things so we definitely need to get ahead of this in terms of regulation and I think that's one part that's unfortunately our systems were designed to move slow our institutions um, and that helps stability, right? You don't want something that is just continue. The whole fun foundation of democracy is that it's supposed to be stable and resilient to like disturbances. But when democracy is getting rebuilt on top of a system that's evolving, uh, it no longer seems to kind of stand. And so we do need to figure out different ways to keep our institutions uh, more in line or hardened for the digital and AI age. Um, and that's going to require adding institutions or adding teams that can focus on it. Because right now what we're currently doing at a regulatory level, we can't even deal with social media. Uh, so adding new AI to that kind of seems like a nightmare. Yeah. And what about uh, the fashion world, especially like, you know, like uh, what do you think like AI entered the fashion world and also regulation and all of that? How, how do you kind of position? 
Exactly. Yeah, it's interesting. I think AI already plays a pretty big role in fashion. So any of the bigger companies like Zara and H&M, they hire like thousands of data scientists uh, that use a lot of artificial intelligence to do things like streamline their supply chain. Um, but in terms of the human touch points that most of us think about in fashion, so designers or fashion models, we're going to see a change in those roles as well. So in a world where you can use AI to generate a realistic image of Pope Francis in a fashionable jacket, you can also imagine a future fashion campaign designed that way as well. Um, on the one hand, it opens up fashion to a lot of new people that maybe didn't have the resources um, to step into the game as intensely as some of the kind of industry leaders. So it changes who gets to be a designer, um, but then it also adds new ethical challenges of things like automation um, and just authenticity. In a world where the human identities that we see may or may not be human, that could send all sorts of things awry. So beauty standards uh, could just become even more out of reach in a world where the, the fashion models we see might not even be human. I mean, as it stands today, we do know that fashion isn't necessarily the most progressive industry, um, but it has made a lot of strides in the last couple of years. And so when we, are we potentially undoing progress by now putting AI in the place of a human and not just a human that has been in that job for since the beginning of time, uh, different demographics that have had to fight for representation um, yeah. now can get automated and those gains can go to whoever can build the technology. Um, and we know that access to building these tools isn't equal. Certain groups um, have more skills and more financial stability based on kind of historical trends and events. Uh, so we can perpetuate historical power balances if we aren't careful. Um, and I also think it is a little alarming when we think about creative roles more broadly, Creativity is something that's so treasured and seems so magical to humans, and it really defines how we relate to ourselves. And when you see something, a machine be able to synthesize creativity and do things like model a fashion shoot or participate in a movie or sing a song, that seems completely alarming because it changes how we relate to ourselves, knowing that we may no longer be the sole engineers of creativity. And that's a different kind of thing to swallow. <laughs> yeah yeah no, I mean, it's wild um, but it, yeah it's 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 it, i mean when you think about it it's, it's wild you know like it, for our brains to, at this point to comprehend you know like yeah you, they can create a song or you know like the way you said like tom hanks could be like <laughs> yeah still, still still acting like 100 years after he's dead or you know the model that you see that looks so real is actually not a real model or that, is, that was designed by a machine and not by you know like that Deep new designer, it's, it's, yeah, that's. But it's also all relative, right? So if we hear a, a trending news story that Tom Hanks can, can act 10 years after he's dead, if you were to rewind the clock 500 years ago, pre cameras, and you were to tell people, we're going to invent technologies that allow you to see theatrical performances with the people not having to be there. In fact, some of the people in that movie are now dead, but you can still see the performance. That would have seemed insane. So, technological progress is all relative. And so where, how we can just rewatch movies and the actors may be long dead, that's thanks to a lot of innovation in technology that historically would have been seen as like, oh my goodness, something very scary. So the future always looks a lot more overwhelming from the present, but you have to realize that all of our different systems change and evolve over time. It's not just taking how we do things today and inputting a technology, how we live and perceive the world evolves too over time. And what about AI in the, like for like content creators and social media influence and everything? How, how is that gonna impact that part of you know, the industry? Yeah, I mean, so AI has already transformed the creative yeah. industries in general because it's invented the creator economy. The creator economy didn't exist 15 years ago. Now, thanks to social media, people make a full living off of YouTube and TikTok um, and podcasts and Spotify, all powered by artificial intelligence. So we've already created and created an industry based on the technology. And so going forward, 
AI is just going to put more tools in the hands of creators. Um, so that could mean maybe you do really great Instagram skits for Instagram reels. Now you can actually have characters that you act with in your script. Um, so it's kind of going to be a bit of a leveling playing field in the world of entertainment. Um, you'll have systems that can edit and add music and change it, your script to multiple languages. Um, you can record, you can record a podcast without actually ever having to record it. Um, all sorts of things that are going to disrupt how we make and consume content. Um, and it's already done that and it's just going to continue to do that going forward. Yeah, and also I was also kind of like uh, reading about this new uh, app where basically like because we live so much virtually that right now you could grant I'm investing in like this kind of technology where if I want to change, I could I would just this and I would switch, change my sweatshirt to I don't know like a Balenciaga sweatshirt, a hat, and it would you know like and then I would project on social media this is kind of my new outfit. I would just have buy you know that that the technology basically. So I'm like, wow, that's kind of fascinating because it's true. So much of our lives is lived virtually and not yep. in real life. Why would I invest in a tangible piece where I could just kind of buy whatever? Yeah. Digital clothing. Um, I mean, in many ways, we even when we take photos, we do so much editing um, that like how somebody appears in their clothes anyways is very different online. Um, but the next kind of logical step is in a world where we have things like augmented reality glasses instead of smartphones, um, you could just program the clothes somebody sees you in versus whatever you're actually wearing. So which means a designer could potentially design a new line every week digitally. And maybe you just subscribe to that designer and then you put on your glasses and you program how other people in smart glasses see you, uh, which totally changes the designer model. And maybe it also helps to decouple a creative designer's mind from the challenges of the supply chain and logistics of fashion. Um, and, and of course, in some ways it could say, oh, well, that's you kind of more in the loss of what was, um, but in many ways, like creative uh, designers have so many ideas and then getting that to market, there's a lot of bottlenecks. And so this kind of just connects the designer more intimately with the buyer who loves the way that designer thinks, uh, which could be really cool. Yeah, it's true, yeah. But I mean, like when we think about it, like I think the concept is very, very cool. It's very smart, and I wonder, like, how like smaller brand and everything will will get into that vein. Like, you know, I don't know how how that will kind of play out. But you know, like for example, us, our whole thing is kind of to create more jobs and more dignified mm -hmm. jobs, and like kind of help like certain skills to survive. And just like it's very, we feel kind of very 1940 compared to kind of this. You know, it's it's interesting to see. Uh, so you're trying to do how, what, how it plays out in kind of, you know, this, this world. Yeah. And I don't think it all becomes digital. I think the more technology that comes a part of our society, the, also the higher value of, of our human experiences. And it's not a coincidence that like wellness and longevity have also started to become one of the most trending and participated in industries as technology continues to rise. So the more digitized and immersed we are, the more we also value like internal states and community and connection. So I don't think it all goes away and we end up just being like cyborgs. Um, I think two yeah. things can be true at once. Um, there can be more easy and efficient ways to change clothes and digitally apply clothes, um, but also the value of our human connection, how we show up in those in those spaces, including um, stylistically, which is often a, a marker of, of time and what you stand for, that all evolves with that too. And I think fashion has always played a unique role in being a communicator of culture. Um, and so as culture changes, fashion has a really great way of almost getting there first and like inspiring the, re the revolution in some ways. Uh, and so I think that that's going to be interesting um, as we move towards a kind of future with more advanced technologies. How do these markers of culture also evolve and ground us to what it makes us uniquely human? Yeah. This is uh, fascinating. We have. <laughs> 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 so what, what is next for you for me um i really hope to continue to make technology a language that everybody speaks um i think that's the best you know the best shot we have at, at getting our future right 
is one where everyone's participated in shaping it. And I think equipping people with the lexicon and the tools to be able to steer their own future not only empowers them and helps people to feel a bit more safe and involved in this world, but it also helps shape a future that's much more inclusive and representative of society. So I hope to continue to bring tech conversations and futurism uh, to society more broadly um, and continue to show up in those spaces and hopefully continue to inspire people to also insert themselves in these conversations too. So, and I think that's very important that's actually a very, very important point. Like, how do you see the rest of the world and like interconnecting into this conversation? You know, like obviously, like it's so different from you know one region of the world to another. So, how how can we integrate this, uh, the rest of the world, in this conversation? Absolutely, like connectivity. While we talk about AI and regulating super smart machines, we have a significant portion. Sorry. We have a significant portion of the planet that can't get online and it's not a, it's not just they don't have physical access there are different cultural barriers in communities where it's not appropriate for certain groups such as women to connect uh, or because so much of technology is centers western voices um people other people outside of that small circle that really small circle in the world don't even know the benefit of coming online because nothing they're never considered or their voices are never centered. Um, and we don't even consider what type of material uh, non-Western voices would want to look up and, and, and be a part of online. So we have a lot more to do when it comes to inclusive, inclusivity. There's no reason why every single person isn't online. From a resource standpoint and a capital standpoint, we have what it takes uh, it's just a matter of actually acting on that and making sure we're not leaving half the planet behind, uh, which as it stands today, we we are. Um, a significant portion of young people under the age of 25 can't access the internet. Even though we say that young people are digital, digital natives, um, that's not true. That's only a select few um, that have grown up in a privileged world uh, where they're able to do that, but most of the population can't. So that's going to take a lot more private public partnerships, a lot more societal awareness, um, around who can actually access the future and who can actually access the economy. Um, and yeah, that's not gonna that's not gonna happen automatically. And there are pushes towards that. I know the UN ITU does a lot of work and and raising that awareness and getting the private sector to invest in things like um, connectivity around the world. But it's going to take everybody, like a massive campaign to make sure we're not leaving half the population behind because as it stands today we, we are and we all kind of lose right a world where people don't have access to healthcare or the economy is worse off for everybody we're we are all better off the healthier more educated and more equal and fair our societies yeah no no for sure i mean it's if it's almost like it's like Futurist, but also like it's so anchored in in today's world. Like you know, like this is like today's conversations is today's world, and this is like it's interesting how you know. You say you're futuristic, but it, I feel somehow it's like it's so anchored in today. It's, I don't know. It's yeah, the future is grounded in the present, and it's important that we always ask whose future and who can access that future. Uh, who are we talking about? Um, because of the future can mean very different things to very different people um, who haven't been given the same access um, or keys to the same room or tools. So yeah, I really think that the future, it shouldn't have to be relative. It shouldn't be, well, depending on where you live in the world, the future is going to look very differently. Um, there's no reason why that has to be the case, especially when it comes to technology. Um, we've seen nothing but productivity gains and de you know, deflationary prices uh, which should technically mean more access, um, but that means we have to intentionally do that, uh, and unfortunately, we aren't um, at a speed that we need to be. And also, like, also, I guess, like, you know, in the future, access to information. What does that mean? You know, how is how is going to look like? You know, when you have people like Elon Musk, you know, like, I think that's also is something that you know people are always like questioning. You know, like, how how do we navigate that? Right? Yeah. Yeah, the information age has proven to be a challenge. And again, AI has quite a big part to play here because 
we, I don't think as a society fully understand how AI already decides what we see um, online and what kind of, it makes decisions about us every day. Um, and so between artificial intelligence and leadership that may or may not, you know, embody the values that some people think are important, um, such as, you know, protecting, not just, not, not necessarily free speech, but making sure environments are safe for all groups to participate in um, and something that kind of pre pre preserves democracy, um, that's be becoming a challenge. Um, and you know, I think one thing that's really becoming apparent to people is who's in the room while the future is being coded and decided upon. And if there aren't leaders in that room that you think possess the values that are needed to move society towards the future that we want, there's also a lot of power for things to go the wrong way. Um, and so that's why, yeah, who's in these rooms really matters. And I think the more empowered and um, educated we all are on how technology works, the, the louder our voices can be in advocating for things that we want to see. Yeah. Listen, I love this. Thank you so much. <laughs> of course. Thanks for thinking of me. I'm looking forward to, I'm looking forward to seeing it and to sharing it. Um, and if there's ever anything that you want me to promote or anything, just let me know. I'm like, I can, if you want me to reshare things, just let me know.